Hello and welcome to the Legends of Opera, where we shall be delving into the lives of the incredible singers who have given us the heritage of opera. <laughs> Placido Domingo, one of the greatest operatic artists of all time. Having performed on the world stage for over half a century in 150 roles, his powerful voice and imposing physical presence make him one of the most recognizable and influential singers in the history of opera. For me, the thing about Domingo is his huge repertoire, 150 roles under his belt. That's incredible. Domingo is renowned for his versatility and has recorded in a number of different languages and conducted more than 500 opera performances and concerts. Domingo is one of the greatest complete singers and he was a complete artist. He's such an intelligent singer. There was a purity, a clarity, a sort of clarion quality. He's widely celebrated for his acting prowess and as one of the leading Otellos of his generation. He was the greatest Otello that I've ever seen live. In terms of his acting and the vocal quality behind it, it was astonishing. On one hand, Domingo was a man of light entertainment. He could be popular, he could be fun. On the other hand, he could go right into the depths, into the troughs of human experience. As well as multi-platinum selling popular music albums, he is globally recognized as one of the phenomenal trio, the Three Tenors. These guys became rock stars. They brought opera to people who would not pay any attention to it. Easily one of the greatest acts in the world of opera ever. Undoubtedly an operatic legend, Placido Domingo is truly one of the kings of opera. Placido Domingo was born in Madrid in 1941. He was surrounded by music from birth as his parents ran a zarzuela company, a form of light Spanish opera. His mother Pepita was nicknamed the Queen of Zarzuela. It's very important to remember that Placido was brought up in this house in which music was always there. His parents were singers, they were always singing, they were always practicing. Music was a key part of Placido's life. They already realized he had a lot of musical genius when he was just a little boy because he could repeat the Zazuela songs that they were learning almost immediately, note perfect. In fact, his mother said she heard him when he was five years old singing one of the Zazuela songs and she said, that boy is a singer, and I'm going to help him as much as I can. They decided to try their luck and move to Mexico when he was about eight years old, and they set up their own professional Zarzuela company, and he got his early opportunities 
as a, as a youngster singing in their, in their performances. He went to a conservatoire and learned to play the piano and took conducting classes as a teenager from Igor Markovich, who was a very famous conductor. As time went on, he realized that voice was his true love, was his great love, and he switched to concentrate his studies entirely on voice and entirely on developing himself as a musical instrument. He was singing as a baritone, supposedly, when he auditioned for the National Opera, and he auditioned as a baritone, but apparently at the audition they gave him a tenor aria and obviously sang it to, to their satisfaction, and so was taken on the training programme as a tenor. It was this switch that would pave the way for his remarkable career. He made his operatic debut at the Palacio de Bellas Artes, singing a minor role in Verdi's Rigoletto, before making his debut in a leading role in Monterrey, Mexico, as Alfredo in La Traviata. Singing Alfredo in Monterey was an important step, but mainly because it was the launch of his international career. His ascent in the first five or six years of his career was quite slow. While Domingo was with the National Opera, he also played the piano on Mexican TV. And I think that's very important to remember that he wasn't just a pure opera singer, he was very hard working. He was working in piano bars, he was even on Mexican television with the, the soap operas. So the word got around that he was a beautiful singer and he was very heroic and handsome. And on the circuit, Joan Sutherland, that great hunter of tenors, heard about him and she said, come to Dallas and sing with me in Lucia de Lammermoor. And of course, he jumped at the chance. After performing alongside Joan Sutherland, the following year saw Domingo appear in the same opera, this time in the role of Edgardo alongside Lily Pons. In the same year, Domingo married Marta Ornelas, a soprano who'd just been voted Mexican Singer of the Year. It wasn't Domingo's first marriage, after marrying at just 16 to a fellow piano student. That was to be a short-lived one. But his marriage to Marta would be a partnership for life, and soon after their wedding, they moved to Israel to sing together with the Israel National Opera. Here he would perform almost 300 times in a variety of roles. When he went to Tel Aviv, he could practice his roles. He could do it in a way that meant he wasn't uh, obliged to present a particular type of personality to the public, so that he could mold his characters in a way that suited him, rather than in a way that suited a director, especially. He sings 12 major roles. That was a very important part of his apprenticeship. That's where he learned to get those core Verdi and Puccini roles into his voice. He's got a brilliant memory. He's a very, very quick learner. But he always says, until I've sung a role 20 times, I don't think I've learnt it properly. And that's what Tel Aviv allowed him to do. After two and a half years in Israel, Domingo felt ready to perform on the recognized international stage and auditioned in New York. He was due to sing Carmen with New York City Opera, but then he had to step in to sing Pinkerton in Madame Butterfly uh, in 1965. 
And although, although it's not the Met, the New York City Opera was important in, it, in its day, so this was a significant break for him. His big break is when he gets to sing the leading role in a new opera by a, an Argentinian composer, which is written in Spanish. So it gets a lot of review coverage, and he's really quite a sensation in that. Another stroke of luck, I think, was his career was in the ascendant when the career of another handsome tenor, Franco Corelli, was in the descendant. Corelli was a very erratic personality, but he had been dominant in the business for about 10 years. And there was a moment at the Met where Domingo stood in for Corelli as Maurizio in Adriana La Couvre, and that was a huge success. Domingo had sung with the Met before on tour, but not actually at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. So uh, stepping in as uh, singing as Maurizio in Adriana Lucuvra was his official Met debut. And he was singing opposite Renata Tibaldi, who was, along with Maria Callas, the great soprano in the Italian repertoire. The Met in New York were absolutely delighted by Domingo. They loved his voice, they loved his drama, they loved his musicality, but also they loved his look. And to them, he was the epitome of an opera star. Domingo would forge a special relationship in New York with the Metropolitan Opera and performed multiple season openers at the theatre. He would also appear there for the next 50 years in a huge range of roles. After much success in America for Placido Domingo, the late 1960s saw huge demand for him around the world. He began appearing at all the major opera houses, including the legendary La Scala in Milan. Domingo was going from strength to strength. He was then invited to La Scala to make his debut there, the, the great place that every opera singer wants to go to. And Alan Rich from the New York Magazine went to see him there and said he was one of the most exciting singers of our age. It was a very quick explosion onto the scene. Vienna, Chicago, New York. In 1969, he made his first studio recording of a complete opera role, which was Manrico in Verdi's Il Trovatore. That was for RCA, and that was the start of a very long, very fruitful association with that uh, recording company. Mm -hmm. 
vita mia breve a te con me His career takes off like a rocket in Europe. La Scala, Covent Garden, Vienna, Munich, Hamburg, Berlin, all the great houses uh, want him. He's incredibly highly regarded within the profession. I interview a lot of singers. They are all full of praise for Domingo's humanity, his professionalism, his kindness. I was actually out in Valencia and the press officer there was talking to me and saying that uh, the previous year, Domingo had been out there singing a role and a coach load of about 200 people from Barcelona had come down to see him. And they all wanted to come to his dressing room afterwards, all claiming they knew him. And the press officer was incredibly fraught by this situation, these Span Span Spaniards milling around all over the place. Uh, and Domingo came out and he spoke to them and yes, he knew them all by name. You always get the feeling that he completely understands the text, that he studied the text, that he wouldn't even think of declaiming the text without understanding everything he's singing. It doesn't matter whether he's singing Wagner or singing Verdi or Puccini or whatever it is. <laughs> While performing around the world, Domingo never forgot his conducting roots. In 1973, he conducted his first opera performance at New York City Opera and increasingly took this role at major opera houses. When uh, the Sultan of Oman decided to open his new opera house, he asked Zeffirelli to do a new production for them and he designed a beautiful tour and Domingo came and conducting. So it was a great event, you know, the, those two great names. Uh, I must say he's a very good uh, conductor as well. I mean, he's, I mean, he's not at the level of Domingo as a singer, but he's a good conductor. So the event becomes magical, you know, having great productions with a great name as a conductor like Domingo, uh, very magical, magical evenings. He built up the conducting from a very early stage. Uh, I think 1971, 72, there was a recital album released with the baritone Cheryl Milnes, who was another great favorite of the RCA recording company. And on one side, you had Domingo singing with Milnes conducting. And on the flip side, you had Milnes giving some baritone arias where Domingo conducted. So that was the first time he conducted on disc. He continues to sing, he's always young, he's also a good conductor. And I remember when he conducted the Fledder Mouse in London at Covent Garden. And it was very fantastic when the Herman Prey on the stage asked to him to introduce something during the second act. And Domingo, after the Vice sang uh, Celeste Aida, a, a little part of Celeste Aida from the podium, and all the audience was uh, enthusiastic for that. <laughs> Despite these conducting roles throughout his career, it was on stage that Domingo was leading the way. The Hotel in La Scala with Domingo Freni and Capuccilli at the time, with Kleiber. For the first time we saw an opera in color because it was the beginning of the color television in Italy. So it was a huge success and I remember they put the screens throughout the squares in Milan and everybody was looking because, you know, it was such an event. Domingo's got a great personality. He loved good directions, he loved to listen, 
He loved to think about the character that was going to develop through the opera. And he was a complete artist. He sang and act in a very natural way, without uh, making strength or forcing himself. A lot of, a lot of singers, they force themselves to act. Because it must be so difficult, you know, because they're so worried about their voice, the way they're going to sing. And to be distracted by movement and, you know, and dressing and dressing and drinking, you know, it's quite difficult for them because they have a big responsibility. And Domingo is a great artist, the most complete uh, tenor ever. Domingo was now regarded as one of the leading tenors in the opera world. Critical acclaim followed every performance. As a respected star of the opera scene and with a driving ambition to perform around the world, Domingo's fame and success knew no limits. In the late 1970s, Domingo was in demand all over the world. His love affair with the Metropolitan Opera in New York continued in Verdi's Rigoletto. The 1980s saw Domingo's success continue, and a move outside of the opera world earned him considerable recognition when he recorded the song Perhaps Love with American folk singer John Denver. Perhaps love is like a resting place, a shelter from the storm. It exists to give you comfort, it is there to give you warm. He went on to record a number of popular music albums, leading to more people around the world discovering opera. The memory of love will bring you home. Perhaps love is like a window, perhaps an open door. Through the 1980s, Domingo had done quite a lot of what is now called crossover, and he'd had this big hit with John Denver, a rather cheesy but very catchy number called Perhaps Love, which had gone platinum. Although Domingo loved doing the passionate big, big roles, he was also using popular music to grow his popularity. He was on TV, Christmas specials, and I do think this really does go right back to his early life with his parents and their light entertainment, their, their popular entertainment for the ordinary people of First Madrid and Mexico City. He wanted to entertain those people as well, and he really believed that everyone in the world should have music not just those who could afford to go to the opera house. Making numerous television appearances on talk shows and news channels, Domingo never stopped his number one love, performing on stage. One particular role that became synonymous with Domingo was Otello. <laughs> I remember Domingo had a different voice, uh, uh, quite a different uh, repertoire. I remember Domingo as Otello. His interpretation of Otello is one of the best that the audience can have the possibility to see. He was the greatest Otello that I've ever seen live. The production at Covent Garden, a wonderful production. Oh, 
Domingo always had a very bronzed quality to his tenor, which really suited the role of Otello and allied with some tremendous acting. It just made it the complete interpretation. <laughs> He sang it so beautifully and nobly and he really inhabited it, he knew it inside out and um, I was lucky enough to hear the, the legendary performances at Covent Garden. Never forget them, absolutely wonderful. He's very, very special to this place, and he's always shown this incredible loyalty to Covent Garden over the years. He's a real performer, and he's a real professional. And in his time here, he had his role debut here in 1971. He's performed 27 different roles. And he's always been known as someone who is completely dedicated to the art and the craft of opera. So he's always impeccably prepared. He's always impeccably punctual, um, which cannot be said for every singer, of course. He's always someone who is striving to reinvent himself and to do different things. So, for example, with a, a nice twist of fate, um, his first role was Cavaradossi in, in Tosca in 1971. And yesterday he arrived here um, to conduct um, some performances of Tosca. He'd just flown in from Beijing where he'd been performing there. And then he had a music rehearsal of Tosca with the singers. And then he was playing through some music. I saw him, he was playing through some music on, on the piano afterwards. And it turned out that he was preparing for his um, forthcoming role in Louisa Miller. Um, and and it's, it's extraordinary, the, the, the work ethic um, and this um, curiosity to do new things. Um, this is after a 50-year career in opera. And I think that's what makes him such a special performer and such a special artist. Atello really became Domingo's signature role. He performed it over 200 times all over the world. For many people, a ticket to see Domingo as Atello was the golden ticket. That's what they really wanted. But I think a lot of people also thought that he a rival with Atello. So he was brilliant in Atello, but he was also brilliant in Cavaradossi in Tosca. <laughs> Continuing his dedication to reach out to as wide an audience as possible, Domingo started appearing in films of operas. La Traviata, Otello and Carmen were significant film adaptations featuring Domingo. Some opera singers weren't quite so keen on performing on film. They were nervous about being frozen, as it were, but he thought it was great. He loved TV, he loved um, popularity, he loved getting out to a different audience. <laughs> He 
He always had this great ambition. I think it's partly because, like all singers of his generation, Mario Lanza was one of his great heroes, to make it big in Hollywood. And there were all sorts of projects were announced of films he was going to make. There's a Carmen that he made with Francesco Rosi. Carmen, faisons la paix. Non! Tu me brilles alors. Ce qui est sûr, c'est que je. He's a good actor. He's good at conveying sincerity and nobility and self sacrifice, all those things which make him wonderful in Verdi's operas. The good one is the Zeffirelli version of La Traviata with Teresa Stratus, is wonderful as. Violetta, and he's terrific as Alfredo. Domingo formed a great screen and stage relationship with director Franco Zeffirelli, making numerous appearances in his productions. Four years after making La Traviata, he would star in arguably his biggest success, Otello. One of the greatest opera films ever made is Zeffirelli's Otello. That is both an incredible performance and an incredible film, and I think really brought Domingo to a huge audience. Otello, I think, is probably one of the best movies ever made on an opera subject. A wonderful way of uh, illustrating that kind of character. And uh, I don't think there would be another singer that he could have done better than Domingo. You see this film, which is a masterpiece of opera, and it's a great piece of cinema uh, for Maestro Zeffirelli as well. <sighs> Domingo's popularity continued to rise. His film roles and crossover into popular music, together with his tireless dedication to his stage roles, saw him as one of the leading opera stars of his era. His popularity would somehow reach new heights after a performance in Rome. By 1990, Domingo has had every accolade you could want. He's been on the greatest stages. He's been the star, endless curtain calls. He's sung all over the world. And he's been on the front of Newsweek as the King of Opera. And he's also been compared to Mick Jagger in terms of the effect that he has on audiences. So he's the rock star. He's the rock star of opera. But in 1990, he did something that was going to bring him to a whole new audience and that was performing as part of the three tenors. Domingo joined Luciana Pavarotti and Jose Carreras to form the three tenors. The result was incredible. It was in the run-up to the World Cup that suddenly three tenors fever hit the UK because the BBC, for their coverage, 
use the recording of Pavarotti singing Ness and Norma. And that was down to one of the BBC football commentators, Gerald Sinstadt, who suggested it. When the World Cup tournament finally arrived and they had this three tenors concert in, in the baths of Caracalla in Rome, there was a huge appetite for it, a huge interest. Initially, the three tenors was conceived as a way of raising money for charity, but it was huge success. And the first album that the three tenors made together sold three million copies almost immediately in the US and went triple platinum. Everyone wanted to buy their music. guys became rock stars. They brought opera to people who would not pay any attention to it. Easily one of the greatest acts in the world of opera ever, and Placido was part of it. In the mid-90s, Domingo's popularity was on another level. And when he sang his signature role, Otello, at the Vienna State Opera, he was so good, so loved, that something incredible happened. He had 101 curtain calls, and that lasted one hour, 20 minutes, which is absolutely unbelievable. Placido has said, he was just in the moment. He didn't know what was going on. It was so out of body experience for him to have something like that happen. In the latter stages of Domingo's phenomenal career, he accompanied his on-stage work with roles as artistic director at the Washington National Opera and the Los Angeles Opera, raising opera to a new level on the international stage. His devotion to spreading his musical passion around the world continued as he founded Operalia, the world opera competition, which uncovered some great talent on the opera scene. Domingo never stopped performing, though, and continued to take on new challenging roles. <laughs> As the tenor career drew towards a close, Domingo decided that he wanted to take on the baritone role of Simon Bocanegra, which is one of the great baritone roles in All Verdi. And I was at Covent Garden when he first sang it in London. And the buzz in the house that evening was quite incredible in anticipation. You don't experience that many times. So already there was a crackle of electricity beforehand. <laughs> All the artistry that you associate Domingo was still there. The phrasing, the legato smoothness, what he was doing, the dramatic understanding of the role was superb. A number of tenors have appeared as baritones. The voice remains much the same. It's just the timbre changes. And you can recognize the singer. What you gain is a sort of 
autumnal timbre, a woody timbre, which is appealing on its own right. That obviously gave him the bug, and he decided to explore Rigoletto, Je mon père, Gianni Schicchi. And he just seems to be going on and on, singing more and more baritone roles. He sort of moves back into the voice of his youth. He's awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian award you can have in the United States. He becomes an honorary knight. I guess the Brigitte Nielsen Award, which is the highest medal in opera. So this man is considered not only a great singer of the role, he's a great ambassador of his art form, he is a great teacher of his art form, and he's doing great things. And it is amazing to see. He's certainly kept very busy. He's now coming up to 80. He's hugely charitable, and he shows no sign of slowing down. And he has this famous slogan, which he's copyrighted on his website, which is, if I rest, I rust. More than five decades since his debut, Domingo must truly be regarded as the king of opera. His countless outstanding performances on stage and screen are a celebration of Domingo's artistic legacy. A great ambassador for opera and classical music, Placido Domingo is a true legend of opera. Domingo is an incredible force of opera. The love of music really comes out of every pore, and he keeps succeeding. I want my memory of Domingo to be as the greatest Nutella that I ever saw. <laughs> Domingo was offering me something I wanted to hear. Words sung in a particular way with a particular level of beauty and intelligence. Where Domingo excelled was he could really plough the depths of extreme human feeling in the greatest of art. Many people are either comic and popular or tragic and deep, and he could be both. He's known all over the opera world as the hardest working guy out there and the nicest person. Along with his once-in-a-lifetime voice makes him the ultimate professional.